My name is Harold Furch, Scott Proft. I'd like to welcome you to the Center for the Economics of the Internet here at the Hudson Institute. Today we'll be discussing incorporating national security interests into federal spectrum policy. American military, diplomatic, and intelligence operations are vital to our nation's security. These operations rely upon a wide array of technologies, including communication, surveillance, and navigation. These technologies in turn rely upon scarce radio spectrum rights that are, are increasingly in competition and even in conflict with commercial uses, such as commercial GPS, satellite, and 5G wireless services. How does the federal government balance commercial, national security, and other interests in radio spectrum? To answer these questions, we've invited two of my colleagues here at the Hudson Institute, Brian Clark and Rob McDowell. Brian Clark is a senior fellow at, at the Hudson Institute and director of the Center for Defense Concepts and Technology. Prior to Hudson, Mr. Clark served in the United States Navy in a variety of capacities. Rob McDowell is a senior fellow here at Hudson and he served as the Commissioner of the Federal Communications Commission from 2006 to 2013. Before we get started, just as a bit of historical background, uh, the concept of allocating spectrum uh, goes back to the late 19th century and early 20th century. And most of the early uh, allocations of spectrum had to do with the military and particularly uh, with naval applications. Uh, the first international conference on spectrum allocation was in 1906 in Berlin, and it was heavily focused on the use of spectrum for uh, ship to shore and shore to ship uh, communications. And at that time, countries from around the world gathered in Berlin to figure out exactly how to coordinate that type of spectrum use. Uh, the next major event in spectrum allocation occurred in 1912 with the, the sinking of the Titanic and uh, the recommendation uh, in the United States that all ships of a certain size uh, be equipped with uh, telegraphy. Uh, wireless telegraphy, of course. Um, uh, today, we have a much, much more complicated set of allocations of spectrum, uh, including both federal and non-federal use. And I'm going to ask uh, my colleague, Rob McDowell, to discuss uh, how spectrum is allocated today. Well, thank you, Harold. And it's uh, great to be on this uh, panel and great to see Brian as well. And thank you, Harold, for putting it together. So yes, you're absolutely right. So um, the Federal Communications Commission, our old agency, is in charge of non-federal uh, regulation uh, of non-federal spectrum. Uh, the Department of Commerce, uh, through NTIA, is the coordinator for all federal spectrum, and that includes DoD uses and every other federal agency. Uh, and there often is a, a conflict there. So many other countries, you have one sort of minister of telecoms. Uh, where it's a unified, we can talk more about this later, is whether or not this is a good idea in this country or not, uh, but where there's a unified um, regulator of all spectrum for both government purposes and uh, private sector purposes. Um, but this inherently uh, causes uh, potential conflicts, uh, especially as uh, the world becomes more hungry uh, for spectrum and all the different applications of it. And every day there's a new idea and that's wonderful. Um, there also are ways to make us more spectrally efficient and to use technology to um, manage spectrum more efficiently. And we can get more into that a little bit later. But that's the, the general construct for folks uh, watching this to remember is the Federal Communications Commission handles all non-federal uh, management of spectrum. And that includes local public safety. So the state police, your local sheriff and fire and rescue and things like that, as well as uh, commercial satellite, um, uh, terrestrial uh, mobile uses, fixed mobile, uh, fixed uh, terrestrial uses, et cetera. So that's it in a nutshell. Okay. Um, Brian, would you like to tell us a bit about uh, uh, national security use of uh, Spectrum? I, yeah, thanks, Harold. And uh, it's great to be on this panel. Uh, it's great to see you and Robert. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So the so the military depends on the spectrum, you know, more or less utterly, uh, to be able to conduct any operations uh, and coordinate them. Uh, military forces have to employ spectrum dependent systems. So they re rely on radios, um, uh, which date back to like you said a century ago, um, which have been updated obviously to include new forms that we can talk about a little bit later. 
uh, sensors that depend on the spectrum, radar, uh, as well as passive sensors like listening devices. Um, and then also things like uh, precision navigation and timing from uh, GPS or predecessor systems that are dependent upon the spectrum as well. You can't reach space unless you have access to the spectrum. So the military forces you know, are, are completely dependent upon their ability to access and operate in the spectrum, uh, which is something that adversaries recognize. So we're all uh, military forces trying to compete a lot, of, a lot of times in the spectrum to be able to deny each other access or to sustain our own access. Um, and then the military gets, you know, in terms of at least domestic use, uh, is allocated spectrum uh, via NTIA and then whatever the uh, FCC is uh, going to carve off and make available for, for, for government use. Um, so the, 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 the military, although it's a big player, you know, because it's, it's got a lot of uh, uh, budget heft, it's got a lot of policy heft, it's got a lot of um, uh, supporters on Capitol Hill and elsewhere, it's still you know, receiving spectrum that's been allocated to it by other parts of government uh, and has to operate within those constraints. Um, one of the limit, one of the challenges that imposes on the military is that means your opponents also know where you are operating in the spectrum. They might know exactly what frequency you are uh, at any given time or what your pulse characteristics are, but they kind of know where you're going to be and they can look in those areas to try to find you and then either use that to detect you or, or use that to jam or counter, counter your efforts or even deceive you. So the, so the, the, the military's dependence on the spectrum is, is a, is a you know, benefit, obviously. We are able to coordinate operations over vast distances and with large numbers of forces, uh, but it also creates this liability you know, that, that we have sometimes uh, exacerbated in the government by constraining where the military can operate in the spectrum, um, which you know, is continuing as, as new commercial uses come into play and, and you know, drive uh, more uh, demand on the spectrum and, and force the military maybe into narrow and narrow allocations. And, and there's ways, as, as Rob was saying, to look at technology as a way out of that, we can talk about that. So uh, that's, I think that's kind of the, the overarching view of, of where the military is in terms of spectrum. We can talk about some of the specific things that the DOD is trying to do to improve its spectrum superiority uh, as we go along. Ryan, could, could you elaborate a little bit on uh, how the military uh, trains with different bands of spectrum and yeah. uh, how it operates globally in different bands? Uh, uh, is, is it the same uh, yeah. for training as it is for operating at sea? And right. Support? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great point. So the, um, domestically, uh, you know, we have a lot of training ranges. Uh, DOD literally has hundreds of training ranges in the United States that all um, do spectrum operations, whether it's just simply your radio networks that allow forces to talk, or it's jamming or sensing. Um, and the, the allocations for those training ranges are given to it by NTIA and by, by, the, uh, by the other parts of government that govern the spectrum, uh, which means that um, DOD has to build systems that operate in those pieces of spectrum uh, and if you, you don't want to go and, and fight in a way that's different than you train, so you're sort of inherently limiting where, how you can operate in the spectrum, uh, even in a wartime environment overseas, because if you haven't trained in a way that, that you know, uh, supports those new frequencies or new ways of operating, then you're probably not going to be successful. So DOD has had a, this has been a significant issue of late um, in particular, uh, and uh, the spectrum of uh, your recent spectrum uh, auctions, AWS3, et cetera, have allocated money to DOD to develop capabilities so that it can uh, essentially constrain how it operates when it's uh, operating domestically in the spectrum and then turn around overseas and then widen its, its aperture in terms of the frequencies it can employ uh, when it goes overseas uh, and make that a more seamless transition for operators. Um, so, for example, S-band uh, frequencies are particularly constricted. Uh, that's where a lot of that's a really sweet spot for military radars. Uh, it's a sweet spot for uh, radars that do uh, air traffic control because uh, it's a high enough frequency that it gives you decent resolution and and uh, precision. Uh, but it's also uh, low enough frequency that's got long range or relatively long range. Um, so the so S-band is, is a place where we get a lot of competition in the spectrum uh, domestically. Uh, between DOD and other civilian uses. It's also increasingly uh, popular as a mid-band for 5G communication. So now we see additional players coming in to look at S-band um, and really L, S, and C bands are all kind of in that same mid-band uh, range that are being popularized as part of uh, 5G. And those are all bands that are popular for uh, military uses, S-band for radar, L-band for communications and some radar, uh, and then C-band particularly for satellite communications. Why don't we drill down on a, a few recent examples of uh, uh, 
disputes or conflicts or workarounds, if you will, between uh, commercial applications and uh, military applications. Uh, Rob, can uh, you describe a, a few recent examples? Sure, and you know, I hope this will be a, a conversation. So Brian and you ought to feel free to jump in. So maybe for the audience to understand that uh, spectrum policy, the jurisprudence is a lot like the management of real estate, the management of land. So with land, you zone certain neighborhoods together. If you think of a town, you have residential neighborhoods that are in one area of the town. You have the busy main street, which is noisier in a different part of town. And maybe on the edge of town, you have industrial or light industrial areas. Those are all zoned by local land use planning commissions and such. Um, and that is a lot like how we handle spectrum. It's a lot like land. So different frequencies are better for different purposes. Um, and of course, brilliant engineers every day are changing what we thought we knew. Uh, I left the FCC eight years ago and there's some very high frequency um, uh, bands, let's say 24 gigahertz, for instance, uh, which when I was leaving the commission eight years ago, that was not being discussed as uh, something that could be used well for mobile wireless for, for 5G services, for instance. Um, so the other part of that, to extend the analogy regarding land, just to kind of set the predicate before we get into the specific uh, debates, is harmful interference. And so that is sort of the, the prime directive, if there are any old Star Trek fans, uh, the prime directive in this case with the spectrum policy is uh, you cannot generate harmful interference to your neighbor, especially if that neighbor was there before you. Um, and that's important to, to understand. Um, so th think of that as a noisy neighbor. And there are sort of three different ways you can mitigate that, really four. Um, one is distance, a physical distance. Can you have a large plot of land between you and your noisy neighbor so that their noise doesn't come over and bother your plot of land, your channel and the radio spectrum? Uh, that's one way. Can you reduce their power level, their noise level, uh, to where you can't really hear them? So they're not that noisy a neighbor. Then they could maybe be closer to you. Uh, could you limit, and this goes into the concept of spectrum sharing, can you limit their use of their land, whether they're noisy or not, uh, to certain times of day or time, time of whenever? Um, and that's another way to, to, to mitigate uh, harmful interference. Um, I'll put a fourth bucket, which is all the technological uh, filters and such that are evolving every day. Uh, so whether it's dynamic real-time spectrum allocation at the millisecond level and things of that nature and software filters, uh, that's another bucket that can help um, uh, mitigate or completely eliminate harmful interference. Um, and every day, again, there are new innovations uh, that are helping solve these problems, as well as yielding a better efficiency of spectrum. So our spectral efficiency uh, is probably more than a trillion times more efficient than it was when Marconi first uh, transmitted uh, back in the early 20th century. Um, so all of those play into how our old agency Herald, uh, the FCC, uh, tries to analyze potential conflicts of uh, neighbors in a band uh, who uh, might harmfully interfere with one another. Um, and that's, it sounds like it's dumbing it down, but actually that, that's, it's a pretty good way to understand spectrum policy. Um, so there have been a number of, uh, of fights, um, you know, you've seen uh, 3.45 and I'd love to hear Brian, maybe uh, talk more about this. If he knows about it, uh, there's going to be an auction, which starts in October. So that's uh, top of my mind. They're about hundred megahertz worth of spectrum in the 3.45 gigahertz to 3.55. Um, but there's also some naval operations there. Uh, the FCC has tried to work with the department of defense on that to, to mitigate harmful interference, but I'd love to hear uh, Brian's view um, on, on how that went. Um, and, and before I do that real quick though, while you're collecting your thoughts, Brian, it's also important for folks, I left this out earlier, there's something called the IRAC, I-R-A-C, not to be confused with the, uh, the country, Iraq, which is the Interdepartment Radio Advisory Committee. And those are the spectrum engineers from across the federal government who look at potential changes uh, in these bands and these radio frequency bands uh, to determine if there's going to be harmful interference and other things too, right? There are other uh, folks in these agencies that have to look like, well, if we have to move out of this band, we have to move to a different neighborhood or down the street, how much is that going to cost? How are we going to pay for that? There are a lot of public policy issues that, that play into all that. So the, uh, 
the IRAC is, is uh, important. Uh, and these are folks who meet throughout the year uh, on a variety of different issues. But anyway, back to 3.45, Brian, that's sort of a, a, a fresh one that's going to be newsworthy starting in October when that auction actually starts. So any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so the um, one of the things that uh, the Navy and DOD have been trying to do is uh, for these systems, you know, so like the SPY-1 radar, um, several radars operate in this in this frequency range. Um, and uh, the, the the challenge is, um, can you you can't it's you can't easily move them out of the frequency range because there there's hundreds of these radars that are out there that are already built, and um, they are usually physically built in a way that is uh, designed around that frequency range. So they're not uh, widely uh, tunable uh, across other frequencies. Um, so there's some constraints on what they could do, but there are changes you can make to try to narrow the part of the spectrum that they do use. Uh, to get to your point about the noisy neighbors, can we make it so that essentially technologically we build fences that uh, are such that, yeah, I can operate a relatively high power, but my uh, side lobes are such that I am not bleeding over into other frequency ranges as much. Um, this has been an argument made by previous uh, attempts to try to you know, jam new, new users into pieces of spectrum. So that can be done uh, on existing radars using uh, some of the, you know, the, the uh, the hardware that it, they can replace some of the hardware that is used to create the, the carrier wave and replace it with hardware and, and software that's going to be able to create a narrower band to try to reduce the uh, amount of territory that the Navy needs to take within that band. And that's, I think, that's right now, for, as I understand, where the negotiation is, is trying to come up with some technological solutions that will slide the Navy to edges such that they can uh, make this band more fully available. Um, and then there's going to be some new systems coming online that replace existing systems that are going to be uh, digital, digitally programmed, uh, digital front end and back end that allow them to be tuned to avoid this frequency range. So those are kind of the two things for the current, you know, they have to make some adjustments, modifications to existing radar hardware so that they can be tuned more carefully. And then uh, updated radars are coming in that are going to be digital basically from the front end. Um, because they got digital analog converters at the radar phase. And therefore, you can update the, the frequency range in which it operates within the limits of the hardware um, more, more than you can with today's hardware-based system. So those are the two paths that the Navy is choosing to go on in this negotiation about how to basically free up this frequency range that I assume is going to be um, desired by, um, I guess, 5G users as well as others. And, you know, Another uh, area, Harold, was uh, just to continue with your question, which is the L-band. And, you know, full disclosure, I, I represented my law firm, Iridium Communications, a satellite company, which I'm... So before we get to that, can we just pursue yes. the 3.45 a little further? Uh, of course. Um, before we lose that tr uh, train of thought. So what we have is uh, 3.45, uh, an auction scheduled for before the end of the calendar year. Uh, here we are in June. Um, as Brian described, there, there are a lot of issues between the Navy and the FCC which have not been resolved yet. Um, there also are other issues uh, about the adjacent band, which is CBRS, which is a, had a similar situation and the resolution there was essentially a lower power level, uh, 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 which is, is good for certain types of uh, architectures of uh, wireless systems, uh, and it's it's been very popular thus far, but it, it's it's a much lower power level than I think a lot of people are talking about at three point four five, um, and some of that might get blasted away, if you will, if uh, three point four five is is used to, for for higher power levels. So there there are a lot of issues I think that have yet to be resolved, and and we have an auction supposedly going to be coming up in the next six months. Uh, Commissioner, how do, how do you see, uh, are we going to get this all resolved uh, in time to have the auction? And yeah, the latest I've read is that the SEC wants to launch that auction in October. And here it is, uh, we're recording this on June the 2nd, so that's not a lot of time necessarily, but it is a big priority. Um, I think it is resolvable. A lot of these issues are resolvable uh, through some of the methods I've you know, pointed out before, which can you uh, create distance between one user and another user. Uh, what about power levels? If you reduce a power level um, in a way the spectrum becomes less useful, you have to have antennas closer together and signals don't travel as far. Uh, and so 
uh, then what do you do? Um, and that all factors into the economics of spectrum, which uh, hopefully we'll talk about a little bit later. But uh, there are some outstanding questions, but I know this is a bipartisan priority. Uh, the, the commission, the FCC right now is divided between two Republicans and two Democrats and they have, they're forced to compromise. It's actually a pretty good model in my view to keep it that way at two to two. Uh, and so they're gonna have to find ways to get to yes. Uh, I'm pretty optimistic that they can in this case. Uh, and so that we will, uh, you know, oftentimes these auctions slip, the, the start dates slip a little later than uh, folks would like initially, uh, but I, I can see it happening or starting before the end of the year. Absolutely. Good, good. All right, I, I interrupted you. You were gonna to go to Alban, so. I was just giving a, first of all, leading with a disclaimer that uh, through my law firm, Cooley, I do represent Iridium, which operates in the L-Ban. But uh, let me, uh, as objectively as possible, give a little bit of the story, which is the L-Ban years ago, decades ago, was zoned, if you will, to be a satellite only neighborhood. What's interesting is when we talk about the conflict sometimes between federal spectrum users like DOD and the private sector, in the L band it's almost exclusively private sector spectrum, yet it gets caught up in these debates. There's a sliver of NOAA spectrum in it, so it's not entirely um, a private sector spectrum, but GPS is in that neighborhood as our satellite communications companies like Iridium. Um, but who are some of the most important customers of GPS and Iridium, uh, but the federal government, especially DOD. So for position navigation and timing, uh, those types of functions and applications for classified functions for our warfighters and the intelligence community, uh, all of those are very important. So those are private sector licensees who have the federal government as uh, a, a customer. And so we have seen in the uh, L-band uh, dispute uh, a lot of private sector um, players who might have the federal government as a customer be very concerned, but also a lot of surprising um, other entities that don't have the federal government as a customer, like the agricultural community. They depend heavily on precision agricultural technologies uh, to maximize the efficiency and production of land and harvesting. Um, that's very dependent upon satellite rooted technologies. Um, uh, there's certainly private uh, aviation, general aviation, um, which don't have a, an application in the defense sector. Um, the, what's interesting is that the L-band fight has been advertised as we need to repurpose uh, portions of that spectrum uh, for terrestrial wireless. And this has been going on for about 15 years. Uh, so it started off, I think, as a 2G uh, debate, and now it's being branded as a 5G debate. So that's how long it's been going on. And there was originally a company called Light Squared, uh, which bought a satellite uh, company and then wanted to repurpose the satellite spectrum for terrestrial purposes, get the land rezoned, again, that analogy, um, to zone it up so that it becomes more valuable. And I know Harold is our PhD economist, is probably dying to talk about how the economics of all, of all this drive a lot of these debates. Um, so uh, the FCC a couple times, in my view, has fumbled the ball, uh, and now there's a, a reconsideration of that because, again, of the concept of harmful interference. And so uh, through the National Defense Authorization Act uh, that became effective as of January the 1st of this year, after a veto override vote, overwhelmingly bipartisan veto override vote in Congress, um, the National Academies of Science, they're reexamining the FCC's order from April of, of 2020. Um, but what's interesting is we're talking about a total of 35 megahertz of spectrum, by the way, which is not, the L-band is not uh, harmonized for 5G. There's no international standards body that says it's 5G spectrum. It was not in the FCC's 5G plan uh, being called for 5G spectrum. Um, so we're talking about 35 megahertz. The, in the past four years, the FCC repurposed about 5,400 megahertz of spectrum, not all for 5G, but a lot of it. Uh, and this is a, a rounding error. So it is advertised that we need the L-band spectrum in order to beat uh, our adversaries, global adversaries, in the race to 5G. What we really need the L-band spectrum for is if we have to beat our adversaries in a military conflict. And having precision navigation, uh, one quick uh, story to tell you, may remember a few years ago, there were some Navy sailors, and I know Brian probably can speak to this, who ended up in Iranian waters, I guess accidentally. There's a theory in the press anyway, that um, uh, 
the, their GPS sig signal, GPS signal may have been spoofed. Um, and so uh, satellite communications down the street from GPS and the L band can help verify, sort of triangulate and verify to see if your GPS signal is being spoofed. That's very important when you have cruise missiles and ships and planes and rockets uh, all needing accurate GPS uh, information. Um, and you can't risk harmful interference in that band. So this is one that uh, is going to have to be reconsidered by the FCC, in my view. Yes, I do have a client interest there, but there are is a large bipartisan and, and growing body in Congress very concerned with this. And two or three, really, of the commissioners, three out of the four right now, the commissioners of the FCC have expressed uh, some concerns about that April 2020 order of the FCC. Yeah, and uh, Harold, the uh, the open discussion brings up an you know an interesting point, uh, an interesting mitigation that could be pursued. So. Uh, L-band is also where we do have some early warning radar. So it's a frequency range that is attractive because it's low enough that you can get really long ranges on your um, radar or pretty long ranges. And so there are some early warning radars that the U.S. operates that uh, operate in that frequency range. Um, but they're geographically separated you know, from, from where uh, you know, satellite you know, communications users might be. Um, so geographic separation is something we employ there to prevent them from interfering, uh, which again, get back to the 345, 355 discussion. Geographic separation will likely be one of the mitigation measures we employ also to keep DOD and, and civilian or commercial users of, of that C-band or CS and C-band spectrum uh, from you know, interfering with one another. So geographic separation could be an option there. Uh, but, but to uh, Rob's point, uh, yeah, we've, we've had many examples of GPS spoofing being employed against U.S. forces. Um, that was the most, probably the most publicly noted one, uh, just because those guys had to get to be guests of the Iranian government for several days. Uh, and it was a big black eye for the Navy. Um, but GPS is extremely vulnerable to that. These GPS spoofers are commercially available. University students, undergrad university students build them as experiments. Um, because it's a low power system. So it's not that hard to create a system that will spoof or emulate the signal that's coming from that low power GPS satellite. So GPS-3, the new version of GPS uh, that's being developed right now or fielded right now actually, is supposed to mitigate some of that because it operates at a higher power, reduces the ability of spoofing to be at impact, and also uh, is gonna use uh, different waveforms and encryption that will be, of course, for a time, harder for an opponent to understand and, and emulate. And then of course, they'll, they'll work that out and you'll have to come up with some new mitigation measure down the road, but at least in the near term, GPS-3 will help to address that. But yeah, if you don't have that L-band spectrum or you've got interference in that L-band spectrum, uh, then you're gonna lose that ability to take advantage of GPS. Uh, and we're already looking at the expense of, of measures to uh, allow missiles and other systems to navigate in the absence of GPS. Uh, and some of these are very expensive uh, measures, you know, chip scale atomic clocks, uh, really high end inertial navigators, which we don't ordinarily think of having to put onto a missile or, or a, a unmanned aircraft that's only supposed to cost a couple million dollars. Suddenly we got to put a million dollar navigation system on it. Uh, but that's, that's one of the challenges DOD is facing. Brian, could you expand a bit on uh, sort of the, the timing of uh, both L band and 3.45 from uh, the Pentagon's perspective? Uh, I, I know some of these cost mitigation issues kind of came up after the fact rather than in advance. And it, I, I gather it's taking a bit of time to figure out how much all of that might cost. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking in terms of the uh, 3.45 auction, uh, again, scheduled for, as Rob said, scheduled for October. And um, yeah. how do we get all this done uh, in the next few months? Yeah, so um, the AWS3 auction is an interesting reference point. Uh, a lot of money was uh, allocated after the fact <laughs> to allow DOD to reduce its need to use those spectrum frequencies. Um, and those have been relatively successful. I mean, there's been a lot of work going on that the Spectrum Consortium has been leading to. Um, and it's, again, focusing on the domestic case. So it's mostly training ranges having to get outside of frequencies that are going to be used by civilian users. Uh, but our military forces would then turn around and operate in those frequency ranges when they're overseas. So it's coming up with ways so that they can operate at home in a way that seems natural, uh, but then you turn around and go overseas and operate in the frequency ranges that your systems are optimized for. Um, that if you did it at home would interfere with you know, commercial telecommunications uses. 
Um, so the A to B is three effort was, I mean, successful in that it has a plan, it's funded, it's pursuing it. But to your point, the timing is not right, right? So we've already, that spectrum is already going away and DOD uh, is having to now try to backfill and come up with uh, ways so that um, troops that are training at home can have you know, basically uh, interfaces that make it look like you're operating just as if you were overseas, but in reality, you're operating in parts of the spectrum that are you know, consistent with what, what you've been allocated. Um, so that, that transition is gonna take a little while, um, which affects training really more than it affects DOD's operations overseas. Um, the 345 to 355 case uh, is, um, is gonna have a similar impact, you know, where it's, it's gonna be on training at home. Uh, also uh, system developers, you know, so radar system developers that build and use radars that are then put on Navy ships that go overseas. Well, they gotta be able to test those radars at home before they finish them or they gotta you know, do some kind of research and development. So they need, you know, some geographic you know, dispensation essentially so they can operate those radars in, a, in, that, in that frequency range uh, within at least their facility or near their facility. So, um, so that, that, that is probably doable within the time frame uh, between now and October uh, because we're not talking about a necessarily a technical uh, mitigation. We're not going to go and necessarily, you know, make all these modifications to radars if, between now and then. We're probably going to focus on using, you know, geographic separation in the near term. And then over the longer term, if we do have to operate more of these radars at home uh, for either homeland defense purposes or training, uh, then we'll have to come up with a, a mitigation plan that, that modifies their um, hardware uh, or their software in order for them to change for which part of the frequency range they're using. Great. Um, well, there, there are several other examples we could go through, but I, I think the, the general point that I, I want to, to get out is um, uh, there are national security interests in spectrum uh, that spectrum policy is increasingly uh, driven by, uh, by the FCC, which has, has some coordination with DOD, but not a lot of co close coordination, I'll put it that way. Um, and, and the question comes up, is this, is this system working well? Or is there a better way of, of doing it? And I, I want to toss that out to, to both of you. Uh, is the system of coordination on, uh, between federal and non-federal users, is it working well? And if so, you know, do we just leave it alone and, and continue on our merry way? Uh, or, or is it showing signs of weakness, uh, sh signs of uh, a lack of uh, uh, taking into account the interests of the other sector? Uh, and if so, uh, is there a better way of approaching this? Uh, Rob, you want to take it first? Sure. So briefly, I tend to be an optimist. I know we see a lot of strife and conflict. The 24 gigahertz uh, proceeding is often uh, used as an example of that. You know, what, what we don't see is that there are a lot of, there's a lot of dialogue and a lot of meetings that go on years and years in advance regarding identifying different bands long before that ever hits even the trade press. Um, and that's a good thing. You know, when it comes to the coordination between, let's say, the FCC and the private sector or non-federal uses of spectrum and federal uses, long-range planning is important here. Um, and uh, so are the economics of it. And then the transparency. So with, with 24 gigahertz, there were several years of public notices and chances for public comment. Um, and uh, there were some concerns that were raised very late in the game. Um, and so I think it is important to foster that sense of cooperation and coordination. And a lot of that can depend on the personalities of whoever heads up NTIA, the Department of Commerce, and whoever heads up the FCC. Um, and you know, one of the most surprising things I learned when I was a commissioner, and call me naive if you want, was how much personality can drive public policy. Um, so if you do have a sense of cooperation and, and trust, um, uh, that can produce very positive results. And yes, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes, sort of sausage making uh, that can appear to be brutal at times. But I think uh, we're actually in a, in a pretty good uh, spot. Now, having said that, when you talk about the economics uh, of all this, um, it's important to note some fun facts. The, the C-band auction, which concluded this February, uh, 
uh, yielded uh, more than $81 billion. Verizon alone, one company alone, uh, spent $45 billion in that auction. Uh, if you were to uh, say that's the gross domestic product of a country, it would be larger than the gross domestic product of several countries, including Cameroon, Tunisia, and Paraguay. Just that what that one company, Verizon, spent uh, for that auction. Uh, so what that tells us is there's an incredible appetite for certain frequencies um, they're more valuable, of course, if it's unencumbered and there's no, there aren't any noisy neighbors, right? So if your land is, if it's a large swath of land and you, it's a, a nice, pristine, quiet neighborhood, sort of a green fields uh, analogy, uh, that land uh, might be uh, more valuable, that spectrum might be more valuable. So that drives a lot of this. Um, and that's hard to quantify the economic value I mean, maybe it's not, Harold, you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but how do you quantify the economic value, let's say, of peace <laughs> uh, by the proper use of the L-band, right? So if we're talking about uh, our warfighters and intelligence community being able to use the L-band for their purposes in order to keep peace and order in the world and domestically, there is an economic value of that. That is a societal good, uh, but maybe that's harder to quantify than if you say, well, but if we put all that all that out to auction, we could raise you know, $90 billion um, for the treasury. And that motivates uh, members of Congress on both sides of the aisle. By the way, quick footnote, when Ronald Coase first published his paper regarding auctioning a spectrum, I think it was the year 1960, he was laughed at and written off for decades as a nut job, right? And now everyone thinks- so it's Members of Congress in particular. <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, all of that sort of complicates things, but I tend to be an optimist. Um, there are some uh, vigilant, knowledgeable constituencies on all sides of these debates. And uh, at the end of the day, I do think it, uh, it works out uh, well, but it's not perfect for sure. Ryan? I think from the DOD perspective, they would say it doesn't work very well. <laughs> <Yes>. um, <laughs> uh, so you have to give to talk about a couple of examples. So if you look at, um, I guess one example where maybe it does work okay is uh, the CBRS, you know, the, the, the spectrum sharing arrangement that was established under CBRS so that you could have uh, people operating that. took in that. years. Right, that took years. Uh, but at least, you know, DoD was right. in the process and they weren't just pushed out of that spectrum right. uh, willy-nilly or arbitrarily uh, before that um, decision was made. So they were part of this long deliberative process to establish the spectrum sharing arrangement so that we could operate uh, in this case, Navy, you know, shipboard air defense radars uh, in that frequency range, um, which would, and then, you know, share that spectrum with commercial users. Uh, and also there's FAA radars that operate in that range. The, um, the issue was that we, you know, we have Homeland Defense purposes that those radars intended to support as well. So post 9-11, we had uh, ships operating off the U.S. East Coast. Uh, doing uh, air defense operations uh, using their spy one radars at high power operating in that same S band, you know, that, that other users want to be in. Um, so that kind of, you know, sharing arrangement is something DOD would, you know, like to have happen maybe with the, the 3.45 and 5.5 uh, band, um, if that's possible, or some kind of arrangement so that the geographic separation could be established so they don't have to go back and do this, this hardware uh, work. Um, but, uh, that doesn't usually happen. Usually the spectrum auction customers would like to get their spectrum. <laughs> they would like to be able to operate it uh, as soon as they can. Uh, and therefore we don't have years for, the, for this process to play out, and allow an arrange, arrangement to be set up. Uh, so DOD often will get kind of pushed to get out of that spectrum and then work out the mitigation measures on the backside, which is what's happening with AWS-3. Uh, and I think that's, that's DOD's frustration is that they feel like, um, hey, we're, we're getting you know, on the back end of this, we spend a lot of money. We don't get nearly as much money in return as we have to spend in order to make the modifications necessary to really operate. Uh, but then at the same time, we're getting pressed uh, to uh, train and maintain readiness um, by operating, you know, in, in, in the United States or in coastal waters off the United States where these spectrum allocation uh, conflicts come into play. Uh, so they, they feel like they're getting, you know, pulled from both sides where, you know, they want People want more commercial access so that they can free up spectrum for you know, these new innovative uses. And at the same time, they've got GAO and others telling them, your guys aren't ready you know, because they aren't able to train sufficiently or not getting enough training done. Or your training's not realistic in a lot of cases 
Um, so one, yeah, I think, I think what you're going to see is DOD is, is adopting, um, in a lot of cases, live virtual and constructive training as a way to address this. So that is a training uh, construct where you uh, shift a lot of your training away from live events to doing them virtually using simulators um, with either real or constructed, you know, um, you know avatar uh, enemy uh, forces that are if they're put into your computer simulation. Um, so you combine that with some live action so people can get used to the muscle memory of operating systems. Um, that approach is, is becoming more and more prevalent in DOD. And one of the drivers for that is this spectrum uh, allocation concern, uh, is that in most of the training ranges, they're, they're already encountering challenges with um, with encumbrances, you know, from the local community, um, and then you know that the need to free up spectrum is just making that much more urgent. So I think you're going to see a lot more effort to try to get out of the the live and do more of the virtual and constructive training on the part of DoD as a way to mitigate this, so that they can they can train like they would fight. You know, so even though they're not using the real system, they can at least not have to pretend while they're at home and do it a different way, and then turn around and go out to uh, overseas and do it the way they would really want to. No, I look, I think both of you make some very good points. Um, I would say from an economic perspective, uh, it, it's a complete mess. Uh, you know, uh, Rob mentioned uh, uh, Ronald Coase, uh, who uh, uh, suggest, was the first person to really seriously, uh, seriously suggest auctions for Spectrum. Um, but all of that really depends on well-defined property rights, which uh, Ronald Coase also uh, pioneered a lot of thought about that. And, and right now we just, we don't have very well-defined property rights, particularly I'd say between federal and non-federal users. And so it's, uh, uh, that is what leads to a lot of these problems. It, it leads to lots of questions about uh, who needs to be protected from interference from the other. Uh, and uh the FCC is reasonably good, I would say, at sorting out those issues among non-federal users. Uh, but right now, there's no good referee to sort out the uh, interference protections between federal and non-federal users with, quite naturally, the FCC protecting the, the non-federal users and no one really protecting the federal users. So I think we've, uh, I think we've got a problem. Um, uh, and, but there's no, on, on the other hand, I have to say, I'm not sure there's a really good answer either. I'm not sure that anyone particularly wants to just send everything to NTIA and, and kind of get rid of the FCC's role in, uh, in spectrum management. Uh, uh, Rob, thoughts about... Uh, so I think one, one thing that does help is just the idea of abundance. And uh, so it, it doesn't have to be a zero-sum game of commercial spectrum versus let's say DOD spectrum, there are other frequencies out there um, untapped. And so going back to something we said earlier, when I left the FCC eight years ago, if you said that 24 gigahertz or 30 gigahertz range is gonna be used for mobile uh, wireless services, uh, I might've been laughed at, I don't know at that point. Um, so you don't know what frequencies might become valuable based on some technological breakthrough. And it doesn't have to be DOD or fed, other federal agencies of spectrum, it might come from somewhere else. So again, you know, um, there was the notion, so I, I was sworn at the FCC on June the 1st of 2006, so a while ago, uh, the notion then was uh, mobile wireless 3G spectrum was only one sub one gigahertz, right? So low band, what we would call now low band. Um, and that was all the best and the brightest were focused on that. Um, and that has changed dramatically in a relatively short period of time, at least it seemed to pass quickly to me. So the past 15 years or so. Um, so, you know, I, I tend to be, again, an optimist that maybe there are other bands out there that can be used to where you're not threatening federal uh, users or, or other users. And at the same time, those, those incumbent users, let's say it's DOD, uh, are finding ways to be more spectrally efficient. Now, full disclosure, I sit on the board of a company called Shared Spectrum Corp, and they uh, invent uh, hardware and software to make the federal government more spectrally efficient. Um, but that's a good thing, right? So in other words, can you use fewer frequencies for more throughput of data, right? Can you use less real estate to produce whatever it is you want to produce? And the answer there, I think, is yes. And so 10 years from now, we will see a completely different um, uh, sort of paradigm paradigm 
for spectral efficiency and how robust things are. And you're effectively manufacturing spectrum. I'll give a quick book plug. Uh, so Marty Cooper, the inventor of the cell phone, has a book that came out in January called Cutting the Cord, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's very well done, but I will defer to him. He's a lot smarter than I about radio frequency energy. And he tends to be an optimist about how you effectively can manufacture more spectrum uh, through technologies that produce spectral efficiency, smart antenna technologies, and other things. But other things we haven't even thought of yet. So I tend to be an optimist in the big picture. And um, so hopefully abundance will help cure a lot of these problems. And, and I agree with Rob. I think, um, so a couple of points on that. So one is DOD is moving to other parts of the spectrum. So uh, satellite communications that DOD uses, you know, so commercial satellite that, that DOD uses are still in the L band, um, but they've moved up for their military specific satellite communications into other bands. So a lot of KU band, um, a lot of C band communications being used for military satellite communications. Um, although GPS will still remain in L band. Um, also, uh, your DOD is looking at uh, you know, using more passive sensors. So one of the big uh, trends right now is uh, if you are a uh, military force, you don't want to use an active radar um, like a SPY-1 or an ANTPY-2, which operate in the S-band. Um, you don't want to use those when you're overseas because they make you a target, right? They're easy to detect. They're easily characterized. Um, and your adversary will you know, shoot you because you, they can see you. You can see this happening in Ukraine. So this is what the Russian forces use as their primary targeting method is passive sensing of an opponent's emissions, whether it's a, a cell phone emission, uh, a radar emission, um, a commu radio uh, communication emission. Um, so passive operations are becoming much more the, the name of the game for US military forces when they're overseas. Um, so passive sensing primarily. And then for communications, there would be much more towards um, low probability of intercept, low probability detection systems, which are, which to Rob's point are highly spectrally efficient because if you wanna avoid being detected, well, you wanna operate, operate in as little re real estate as possible, right? Just like if someone's trying to find you on the ground, you wanna be in the smallest part of the ground that you can be. Uh, and then you would obscure yourself by operating at low power, by you know, using uh, pulse widths that people aren't gonna recognize. Um, so that spectral efficiency benefits you know, the DOD operationally. The one challenge then becomes spectrum sharing because uh, if you wanna hide uh, in the spectrum, being spectrally efficient is important, but you also need to be able to move around in that spectrum just like you wanna move around on the ground if you wanna try to avoid being shot. Um, so uh, you've gotta work out a mechanism so that your, your fellow users of the spectrum can see when you're moving from place to place in the frequency range uh, and then can adapt. You know, so you can all keep out of each other's way uh, in real time. And those technologies are, are you know, being fielded now. I mean, there, there's lots of places where those, those types of technologies have been pursued. The simple versions of them are already in our cell phones. So it's not like that's a, a new idea. Um, so yeah, so spectrum efficiency is something DOD has been pursuing op from an operational uh, imperative as well as passive sensing. Um, so I think you know, from, from DOD's perspective, th this is the way that they need to go in the future is more dynamic spectrum sharing, more spectral efficiency, more passive uh, NLPI, LPD operations. Uh, and their new EM spectrum superiority strategy talks about this. So that would be something I think, you know, that, that we could highlight is that DOD is moving this direction. It's a matter of how do they get the funding, you know, to support this, this evolution um, and the, the spectrum auction funding, like we saw with AWS3, may be a source for that. Well, look, technological progress is always going on and, and has been, it's been going on in uh, spectrum for over a century. Um, that, that's going to happen. Uh, we will get uh, greater spectral efficiency. We will be able to develop these new bands that, that Rob is describing. Um, but that doesn't resolve the, the, the lack of what I would call clear property rights. It doesn't resolve the lack of who decides who gets to take advantage of the spectral efficiency. Um, there was increased spectral efficiency in the Soviet Union for, for a century, but it didn't uh, it didn't create property rights. Uh, it uh, frankly, it exacerbated the problems of the lack of clear property rights. Uh, without clear property rights, you uh, the, the greater the wealth, uh, in fact, the greater the inefficiency when you don't really know who's who's in charge. And what we have in Spectrum today is um, we don't have uh, very clear uh, property rights, particularly, I'd say, between federal and non-federal users. Uh, who, who is the referee? Not only who's the referee, but what's the rule book? <laughs> what game are we playing here? 
And it's a game that seems to, to be very, uh, uh, seems to change over time. Um, so, um, but, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> Rob, how do, how do you respond to that? Well, again, I tend to be an optimist. Uh, <laughs> I, and that these issues will, will get resolved over time. And there's a lot of sausage making and conflict uh, while you're trying to make these tough uh, decisions. Um, the clear property rights issue is an interesting one with dynamic real-time spectrum allocation. Um, is it a free for all? Uh, you know, I, I'm reminded of, and I know we're short on time, so I'll, I'll be quick, yeah. but my father grew up on the Tex-Mex border. My grandfather was a rancher at two ranches in Mexico. And just over the border from Del Rio, Texas, which has been in the news quite a lot recently, um, there was uh, a doctor, uh, Dr. Brinkley, who had a 1 million watt transmitter radio station. Of course, it was AM at the time. This is the 1940s. And Dr. Brinkley's signal reached from Delray, from the Mexican border, just on the other side of the Rio Grande, all the way to Chicago and St. Louis. And, you know, and he had these sort of quack medical cures. You know, I don't know, he was selling monkey glands or something. I don't know what. Yeah. Anyway, this was uh, set up before the Communications Act of 1934, uh, before the creation of the FCC and the Federal Radio Commission, and before some treaties entered into between the U.S. and Mexico and other countries regarding all that. So he, my father would tell stories about how he was just a mile or two away from this huge transmitter emitting tremendous amounts of energy, how the screen doors in their house would vibrate with the no, with, you could hear the voice of the, the, you could hear the radio show, in other words, through the screen doors. Okay, so that's, I think we could all agree, harmful interference, and you don't want that. So it's not necessarily might makes right, you don't want that, um, and, but that would be no rules, free for all, um, and uh, that doesn't work. Uh, so we, I think we can all agree on that, uh, and dynamic uh, uh, real-time spectrum sharing opens some opportunities, but also some threats to your point, Harold. And we're just, we're gonna to have to figure it out, but we're gonna need members of Congress in particular and the FCC to all understand the national security implications of this and the FCC, something we could devote a whole nother segment to. The FCC doesn't historically spend a lot of time briefing itself or getting briefed on national security issues. I think there's hope there. We've seen them act in the, the Huawei context and the ZTE context uh, here in the past couple of years on a bipartisan basis, and that's uh, helpful. Um, but uh, I think they do need to understand more that what they do has uh, uh, implications in the national security realm. But I do remain an optimist, so we'll see. Okay, good. And with that, let me think. Uh, both Rob and Brian for, for joining me today to uh, discuss national security and spectrum policy. Uh, we will uh, continue this discussion among ourselves, but for now, let me say uh, thank you to our audience for listening today, and we look forward to, uh, to, to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you, Harold.